My name is Chell Miller. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm joining from Troy, New York. And I'm the communications director at the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I'm also joined by a couple of my colleagues at NISCASA. We've got Alyssa Abbott, uh, who uses she, her pronouns, and Artisha Hill, who uses she, her pronouns as well. And they'll be monitoring the chat this afternoon. I'm so glad to see some familiar names as well as some new names in the chat. Um, keep your introductions coming. I love to see who's here. While you're introducing yourselves, we'll get a little bit of logistics out of the way. So if you have any technology problems, um, if you can't hear the audio or if you can't see what we're sharing, you can enter that in the chat box or email me at cmiller at niscasa.org. That's C-M-I-L-L-E-R at N as in Nancy, Y-S-C-A-S-A dot org. And if you have content questions, you can enter those in the Q&A box. You should see that option either at the top of or bottom of your screen. If you can't access that, you can pop it into the chat as well. This webinar will be recorded and it will be shared with you as well as the PowerPoint slides and any resources we talk about. Great, glad to see you all here. Our agenda today will be, we'll give you a little bit of context to this webinar, um, what we're doing, why we're doing it. We're gonna go into an introduction um, exploring what transformative justice is and what it can look like. And we'll watch a short, a brief uh, recording of a webinar that we hosted with Spring Up earlier this year. And then we'll have time to reflect on what we've heard and talked about. So with that said, we're just going to dive right in. The context for this webinar is um, it's part of our Ending Violence Without Violence webinar and virtual training series. The series introduces participants to the core principles of restorative justice, transformative justice, community accountability, and other non-carceral approaches to violence prevention and response. In other words, approaches that don't rely on the criminal legal system. The webinar series underscores the importance of building communities that can prevent sexual violence, respond to harm, and heal trauma. We've got resources and recordings on a website we've created. That's www.endviolence2020.com, which I'm going to put in the chat too. The broader context of this webinar series is that it was originally envisioned as lead up for a conference of the same name that we had planned to host in June 2020. But because of the pandemic, we were unable to host this conference. So if you hear a, any mentions of the conference and the recording we're going to watch today, um, that's what we're referring to. And if you can't find information about the conference, that's because the conference is no longer happening. So just wanna clarify that you haven't misheard anything. There was a conference and now there is not going to be one. Um, but we wanted to revisit the conversations that we had started earlier this year. So in order to do that, we're hosting these webinars where we're screening a recording of a webinar that we previously hosted um, with a facilitated di discussion hosted by NISCASA staff. So next, we're going to offer a very brief introduction to transformative justice. And after that, we're going to watch a webinar recording with Spring Up um, that we had originally presented in February 2020. We did ask folks to review an article ahead of time I'm going to put the title and link to that in the chat in case you weren't able to access it. It's called How Advocates 
or how can advocates better understand transformative justice and its connection to gender-based violence intervention and prevention work? And with that said, we're gonna talk about transformative justice, particularly as defined by Mia Mingus in her blog, leavingevidence.wordpress.com. Transformative justice, according to Mia, is a political framework and approach for responding to violence, harm, and abuse. It seeks to respond to violence without creating more violence and or engaging in harm reduction to lessen violence. It acknowledges that systems like prisons, police, and ICE are sites where violence takes place and that these systems were created to be inherently violent in order to maintain social control. Transformative justice responses to violence do not rely on the state, for example, police, prisons, the criminal legal system, ICE, or foster care systems. They do not reinforce or perpetuate violence, for example, oppressive norms or vigilantism. And they aim to cultivate healing, accountability, and safety. In other words, the things that we know do prevent violence. It's important to note that transformative justice as a framework was created by and for communities who historically choose to or cannot safely engage with the state. For example, black communities, indigenous communities, immigrant communities of color, poor and low income communities, people with disabilities, sex workers, and queer and trans communities. Transformative justice also acknowledges that violence does not occur in a vacuum. Therefore, we must work to end the conditions that foster violence. For example, capitalism, white supremacy, poverty, trauma, war, mass incarceration, displacement, ableism, and sexism. Transformative justice-based interventions can take many forms, but more often than not, they include the following features. First, supporting survivors around their healing and or safety. Second, working with the person who has caused harm to take accountability for the harm they've caused. Third, building community members' capacities so they can support the intervention as well as heal and or take accountability for any harm they were complicit in. And finally, building skills to prevent violence from occurring in the first place and supporting community members' skills to interrupt violence while it's happening. We'll share this after the webinar, but there are a series of examples and case studies that Mia link, links to in this blog post. Um, some audio about community responses to domestic violence, there's a film, Hollow Water, that explores community-based responses to violence and a series of other links here too in the PowerPoint. So with that said, um, and if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. With that said, we're going to watch the recording of the webinar that we had hosted in February with Spring Up. So just give me one moment and I'll get that recording going. One moment, folks.
So you should be seeing, for those of you who are joining um, by a computer, um, those of you who are joining just by audio, you won't be able to see this. But you should be seeing uh, the YouTube video. Can we have some confirmation in the chat that you see that? All right, thank you so much. So I'm going to start playing this recording. And if you don't hear it, please enter that in the chat as well. Um, we're starting about partway through their original recording. That workshop. Yeah, I would definitely say if you're curious about campus practices, come to the implementing RJ, TJ in your organization session, right. yeah. which is like, it's like a five hour session. There's yeah. a lot of details. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this is a lot, but I think that with the interests and kind of path that we've developed, these are opportunities that we, you know, recognized as, um, yeah, just ways to, to build our skill in these practices. I think many of these later ones are, um, more formal ways of implementing this in ways that we had been doing more informally earlier on. Yeah, so um, that kind of all comes into who is Spring Up. This is a photo of, of some of our fellows from our uh, fellowship that we were just talking about. Um, but we do consent, gender, and power education. Uh, we facilitate and train around transformative justice for gender-based violence. We do diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting and coaching for organizations and individuals. Um, we hold healing spaces and uh, try to integrate disability justice into everything that we do, including our training. We practice popular education and participatory action research. We're very focused on evaluation and growth. Um, and we're storytellers and fiction writers. And so that's just kind of what we do at Spring Up. It can be hard to describe for people who don't kind of understand these topics, but hopefully hearing more about our story, you can see what this work means to us. Mm -hmm. And so our mission is um, cultivating a culture of consent and liberty for all. And that's kind of the through line in all of these topics. Um, so then we wanted to, we're a bit behind schedule, so I want to keep things moving quickly, um, but we wanted to talk a little bit more about what references we're making in our work, um, and Miriam and um, Sujatha and Mimi and a lot of the folks that you all have been hearing from are some of the folks that we look up to, um, learn from, whether it's their resources or them individually, and so um, Mia Mingus from the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective uh, said this, and I think that it's a really good articulation of some of what we've been talking talking about. It's important to remember that many of these people and communities have been practicing TJ in big and small ways for generations, trying to create safety and reduce harm within the dangerous conditions they were and are forced to live in. For example, undocumented immigrant women in domestic violence relationships, disabled people who are being abused by their caretakers and attendants, sex, work sex workers who experience sexual assault or abuse, or poor children and youth of color who are surviving child sexual abuse, have long been devising ways to reduce harm, stay alive, and create safety and healing outside of state systems, whether or not these practices have been explicitly named as transformative justice. Mm -hmm. I see um, we, we missed a question. Yeah, chat. and so if, um, if any of you would like to um, volunteer in the chat ways that you believe that you've been um, cultivating your roots of transformative justice or doing things to um, alleviate conditions of harm, um, definitely would love to hear about that. Um, and do you have time? Should we check? Yeah, it right depends now? on what the topic is. Yeah. Chelsea, can you tell us what the question is? Yeah, so it's less of a question and more of a comment, so we could address it um, very quickly, and I feel comfortable doing so. Um, so the comment is more of abolitionism to the speaker, who is a white woman, resonates as a cause related to the end of slavery and the campaign to gain the right to vote. Um, and it didn't occur to them that we were referring to issues of mass incarceration. The reason that we're using that language is it's a it's intentional. It's it's using the same language as anti-slavery, uh, as slavery abolition. Um, so yeah, those are deeply connected. Yeah, it's the idea that the current prison system is the continuation of the of enslave, enslavement. Um, and that's specifically when you think about the 13th Amendment um, and that yeah. within the abolition of slavery, it says that no people will be enslaved 
other than people who have committed a crime. And that means that literally the abolition of slavery had a caveat, which was that you can continue to behave in ways that would be categorized as slavery um, if you're talking about people who are incarcerated. And that's why it's the continuation of that practice and movement of abolition to take it to the to its ultimate conclusion. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, continuation of um, a race-based caste system, both in how especially Black people are targeted for offenses that everyone commits, um, but are overpunished for those because of like surveillance. Um, and then also the fact that people in prisons are working for pennies um, to, you know, participate in the economic system and without being compensated for that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad you, you highlighted that because it is intentionally the same language. Um, so continuing in this, yeah, if anyone wants to put in the comments um, any ways that you see yourself identifying roots of transformative justice in your work, we're going to share some of the lineages that have impacted us. And we'll do this a bit quick, quicker because I think we've already mentioned many of these. So particularly women of color organizers, transformative justice and community accountability practitioners, most of whom that we've learned from for a longer period of time have been women of color, um, as well as family and cultural practices that just didn't rely on the state. Um, so even my family in Italy, my family in the States, there have always been ways that we've managed harm without calling someone else. Um, as well as there are a lot of formal resources like anthologies, toolkits, zines, webinars, videos like this. Um, and I think some important shout outs are Miriam's most recent um, release of Fumbling Towards Repair, Creative Interventions Toolkit that Mimi made is incredible. We're really excited about this new book by um, Leah Najeris, Beyond Survival. There's just so many amazing, amazing tools out there. The revolution starts at home. Um, another route for us is particularly queer and trans folks, I'll say that's like the thing that I've experienced the most in my life is resource sharing strategies, community-based services and care, collective action and self-advocacy, particularly work that um, sex workers have done to design support systems for each other, um, and spaces of liberatory joy and play. There's also some really, really cool things being done, including with Pussy Palace in London, um, about designing uh, safe spaces that are about play and joy and um, partying. Mm -hmm. And then um, we always mention um, ACT UP and the HIV AIDS crisis as being a, I believe, really powerful example of transformative justice, of people like literally being killed and coming together to organize to really shift the conditions, get the medicine they needed, get destigmatized, and get um, health resources while supporting each other. Um, um, we will have a really extensive book list at the conference in June. Yeah, and then um, perhaps Chelsea, you could um, take some notes on books we're mentioning. I'm, I think you probably know most of these, um, and then we could share that with uh, folks after the fact. Yeah, I am already. Thank you. Great, Thank thanks. <laughs> um, and then indigenous communities there, again, like Lee said, we um, are relying on prisons in a way that is unprecedented. And so literally every culture in the world um, has other practices that are not this that we can draw on. And that includes indigenous folks in the United States. I think it's really important to shout out the work of the Diné community or the Navajo community, especially Justice Yazi. Um, and there's just uh, even the circle keeping practice that we learned through like Kate Pranis was developed in partnership with the Yukon folks and First Nation uh, in Canada. So there's just so much there. There's also just uh, especially frameworks for responding to large scale state violence, like the truth and reconciliation uh, process in South Africa or the grass courts in Rwanda, which we lived in Rwanda for a while. And that's a big reference for us. Um, we talked about intentional communities, including faith-based communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, whenever you're creating an organization or especially a living community that is um, not, that is intentionally having different norms than are expected um, in mainstream society, you need to really be intentional and mindful about the agreements you're having, the vision of the community, what, standards of behavior, how are you going to address things in the community, um, and that draws on a lot, including, um, you know, thousands of years of monasteries and faith-based communities. There's this really, really theoretical technical book um, called Tools for Peace that 
was really influential so to awesome. us earlier on. It's by a, um, Andrew? a monk in the order of uh, St. Benedict. And he just was reflecting on um, living in a monastery. Um, and it was, it's really interesting. Yeah, so that's another reference. Restorative justice, as we've mentioned, peacekeeping circles, the RCC model from New Zealand, as well as I love the three-tiered model that Arjoy, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, des designed for school in in implementation. And we'll talk about that a lot more in our session about how organizations can implement restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, but you can look that up. There's a bunch about it online. And then abolitionist organizing and harm reduction around the prison industrial complex. Um, so there's just, there's so much around that. You know, I've been involved with uh, Southerners on New Ground, and there's just a lot of different, um, the Silvia Rivera project has some really great resources, just how can we support folks who have been impacted by the violence of this system mm -hmm. as we're doing this work? Yeah, and then, um, you know, a decent number of the tools and frameworks that we use um, or draw on actually do come from sociology, psychology, mindfulness. Um, and we list all of these because often, um, especially white folks who are wanting to do work like this, um, have this immediate concern of like, I'm appropriating, I'm taking indigenous practices, this is not ethical. Um, and, you know, definitely listen to those instincts, right? I think if you are co-opting people's practices in a way that doesn't feel authentic to you, listen to that, right? But there are so many ways of addressing harm and violence that might feel more authentic to you um, that you can draw on. And so I know we're like just dropping a lot of references, but any of these things are joy. You know, you can Google, you can look up, um, and there are so many resources that, um, that you can educate yourself further in. And luckily, because this is recorded, you can always come back. I yeah. know we speak quickly, but you can pause between we, when we name the different things, or maybe Chelsea will be able to type it up, but we don't have a ton of time, so we're just trying to throw as many out there as feel relevant. Um, so then we just wanted to share a little bit more about how we choose what we work on. Um, so we particularly focus on transformative justice organizing. So it means using storytelling, popular education, organizing, as well as designing alternatives and solutions to cultivate cultural norms that are more conducive to transformative justice, restorative justice, community accountability, and gender equity. While we do manage some cases, which I'll talk about a little bit lower, um, a lot of our work now is more around education, storytelling, and just shifting those foundational norms so that we have less cases to manage and mm -hmm. that we can coach and support other folks who are facilitating cases um, while we can focus on things that have uh, really large-scale impacts. Um, so like I said, we also facilitate cases and offer support or coaching to other, facilitates, uh, other facilitators. Um, a big focus for that is kind of the difference between crime and harm. Right, and I think this is important to say when we're saying strategies that don't involve the police. People are like, somebody's going to kill someone and you're not going to call the police, you know? Um, I think it's really important that a lot of harm, especially gender-based violence and sexual harm, we know that the criminal legal system does not respond well at all to gender-based violence, um, especially, you know, domestic violence, especially in queer and trans contexts. Right, so um, much is not reported, and if it is right. reported, it's often mismanaged. Yeah, and you can see cases that are, like, seem very strong that don't meet certain levels um, of proof, and so sometimes people file civil cases instead of criminal cases. Um, that's one way that um, people who don't meet some of those burdens um, try to access resources, but also um, a lot of people just wish that people cared what happened to them and were willing to support them. And um, there are a lot of community-based things that we can do to shift the norms around um, abusive relationships, around um, intimate partner violence, and um, especially around like incidences of sexual harm. So I think there are two pieces here. One is that when you're thinking about a crime, the reason why it's, you know, uh, the state versus this person is because the thing that's being responded to is not the fact that you harmed another person. It's the fact that you broke a law. So you harmed the state and that's what's being uh, responded to. Mm -hmm. So instead of focusing on breaking the law or breaking rules or violence against the state, uh, our focus is on harm that's occurred. And that would be why survivors aren't as central to the process of the criminal legal system, because it's not actually about the fact that they were harmed. It's about the fact that a law was broken. Um, and so by centering harm and centering the experience 
experiences of survivors, that's one of the major ways that we are different from the way that the legal system operates. Right. The second thing is that we focus on bridging the gap in response. So most likely we're saying most sexual and gender-based violence does not make it through formal processes or meet legal definitions and standards, but is still harmful. That is what we get involved in. And so there are different types of practitioners who get involved in different things. We don't actually involve ourselves in any case that has any uh, you know, touch point with the state. There are ways that we've been brought in by restorative justice programs to support and facilitation of a diverted case. That's a different thing. But the majority of what we do as an organization is things that don't involve the police at all. And usually cases that no one would involve the police, either because they just really don't believe it or because it's not technically illegal, it's just harmful. And so even our documentation and things couldn't be used in the legal case because it's not technically illegal. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we are managing those cases, what are we doing? We, uh, it's really important to be aware of the cultural, societal, and historical power dynamics at play. So we try to work with communities that we identify with, that we know, um, and then we do as much as we can to try to understand the history of that uh, family, that community, what kind of violence has happened in the past, and how might that be impacting the dynamics here? What are the values and cultural norms in this um, community? And then we try to meet the needs of survivors, provide perpetuators with, and I say that intentionally because everyone perpetuates systems of violence, so it's not that some when it's like they're a perpetrator. It's just every one of us has been a perpetuator, but that's the role that they're playing. Um, perpetuators with opportunities to understand the impacts of their actions and make amends and support communities in learning from the harm and making future harm less likely to occur. So when we are managing cases, that's what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now the, the next bit of this, so we're significantly behind time. So we might go a qu bit quickly on this mm -hmm. and you can definitely screenshot um, if you want to. But so we break down a kind of the way that we set the expectations for the space, that there are values, which are ideals we strive towards, but that it's kind of hard to make tangible or know exactly you're not being, you know, liberatory in the space. I'm not sure what that means. Um, and then community account, uh, community agreements are formal practices or, you know, things that we can literally do that we can hold ourselves accountable to. So it can be clear cut, are you or aren't you doing this? Mm -hmm. And we have that, that, di that divide because values are really, really important and shape the space, but they're also very much up for interpretation and don't always become operationalized. And so the agreements are ways that we operationalize that, that. And when we hold a process, we share these with folks and then they have the ability to identify which ones really relate to them and their work, as well as add other ones um, that will guide the entire process that we work on with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just what are we emphasizing in this presentation are um, two really huge pillars of transformative justice, which is storytelling and kind of locating the personal, um, and then also values. Like, those are just um, really huge cornerstones of, of transformative justice. Um, so we're just gonna dig in. Yeah, and I think... So, um, oh, thanks, yes. Sorry that you all have to leave, but you can definitely listen later. Yeah. Um, so shall we read all of these or... I think maybe we, with time, perhaps we should just read the titles. Read the titles and kind of explain it a little bit. Yeah, and you can see at least um, the definitions are this way because if I say transformation, you, you know, you might have a totally different interpretation of what that means or the way in which I'm practicing transformation in my, you know, personal practices might be really different from um, an organization trying to transform their processes. And so having a definition that at least you can say, I don't agree with that sentence, or I think we should add something is really important to us to like make the values explicit. Yeah, so for transformation, one thing I wanna say is that transformation is more than intention. It's strategy, planning, time, study, self-reflection, a support system and tools to implement new habits and beliefs. Um, so I think that's really important. It takes time to transform. Um, and then the two practices that we have are storytelling. We've talked a lot about that and we hold a lot of spaces for storytelling, mm -hmm. um, um, fictional and nonfiction. Yeah, and I do wanna emphasize though one word where we say transformations catalyzed by storytelling are consensual, right? Like if I tell a story that causes you to have personal reflections, you are totally in control of what lessons you take from that and how you implement that in your life. I'm not telling you, I told you this story and so now you need to do this. Although I might have like a request or a call to action, right? But I think that that's um, very important when we're thinking about behavioral change 
um, yeah. And then reflection and evaluation is so important. It's a, it, you have to have a culture of evaluation, not like one person on the team that does it. It's really like for us, it's a lifestyle of constantly iterating and growing and responding to feedback. And so you need to have time and thought and intention towards having space for reflection and evaluation. Um, the next value that we have is healing and really important healing is a process, not a destination. Um, and it can't be bounded. So it, that's not like the outcome of a process, but it is something that's important to us. Um, and yeah, we talk a little bit more about the fact that in some spaces, there's more of an emphasis on being able to identify kind of the ways that you've been harmed and less of an emphasis on how you're healing and, and working through your traumas. And that's really, really important, especially for facilitators as we're doing this work. Um, and then the two practices or agreements are care for yourself and your people. I heard, first heard that from Miriam at one of her trainings, Miriam Kaba. Um, and just we don't enter spaces on our own. We always have people that we care for or who care for us. And as much as we we want to cultivate presence we also want to take care of ourselves um, and the people that come with us and also i really want to shout out the book care work yeah i don't think we have a copy of that right now but, but it's by leah lakshmi pipenza samarasina yes thank you I, I have a bit of a hard time saying her name but it's a really 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 powerful book um a, a, a anthology all about the nature of care work and she calls for a fair trade care economy where care is consensual reciprocal equitably distributed and appropriately valued yeah um and then accept incompletion just like healing takes time and is not bounded and doesn't become complete most of our processes don't most of our meetings don't and especially if we're going to embrace emergent strategy we need to be okay with not getting through everything that we necessarily planned on um, and this idea of urgency and completion is really core to capitalism um, and, and providing services and providing services yes true um, and meeting reporting requirements um, so it's all about finding a sense of balance and trying to find a way to be present um, still get things done but not be so focused on completion and urgency. Okay, the next value is solidarity. Um, so people are experts in their own reality. So we work with directly impacted folks and we also really partner with um, other organizations and people who have shared values. There's a lot of siloing and competition and we feel really, really strongly that we need to work together and collaborate and support each other's work in order to do this um, effectively. And so the practices that go along with that are subjectivity and specificity. We're always telling folks not to generalize, use I statements, and try to share specific examples of things that you're talking about instead of saying, you know, people always do this or, you know, people feel this way. Try to share a specific example. And that really helps us kind of communicate across difference and locate where these opinions are coming from. The other one is shared labor. Uh, this is a long, these are long and messy processes. And often there are certain people who are expected to do more of the weight mm -hmm. of labor and that's often femme folks queer and trans folks people of color um and so a way that we operationalize sur survivors themselves yes. often um because the survivor is really invested um it, yeah it's definitely not not good when a survivor ends up doing like a disproportionate amount of the work um survivor centered is not the same as survivor led um, and we're going to be talking a lot more about the roles in processes, how many people can have roles in supporting a process right. um, at, the, at the conference in the session on facilitating a process that will involve a role play too. So if you want like tangibly like how do I do that? Um, try to come to that session if you're able to come to the conference. And we keep really detailed timesheets. I was really irritated by this at the beginning because I thought of it as like a manager thing to like make sure you're getting your work done, but it's really part of that evaluation reflection piece when you can actually tell who's doing what labor, how long it takes them. Um, that can help you be much more thoughtful about how you're evaluating the distribution of labor. So instead yeah. of making it about micromanagement, it can really be about evaluation and equity and fairness in the distribution of labor. Right. Um, okay, the next value that we have is sustainability. Um, Accountability and transformation is not about quick fixes and easy solutions, and that means these things take time. Um, and we need to have uh, strategies that center long-term sustainable changes that maintain after the intervention is over and that impact people broader than those directly involved in the process. And that can be challenging, but that's, I think, what makes it transformative as opposed to 
some of these other approaches. Um, and part of that is also finding a sense of balance where as facilitators, as organizations, we want to do everything under the sun and we need to find a way to sustain ourselves, take care of ourselves and meet our needs. Um, whether that's figuring out ways to fund this work, having boundaries around what kinds of cases you take, accepting that things will take a long time to manage. Um, it's really important that we don't burn ourselves out because there's such an overwhelming amount of work to be done. Yeah, and I think um, that's especially important in, um, you know, if you're managing a state diverted restorative justice case, like, you want to close it, you know, like, there's a pressure to be like, okay, how many cases are we doing? Let's keep it moving. Um, let's just reach a good enough point of resolution and move on. Um, whereas transformative justice cases, because they're so involved in shifting the conditions um, and tend to be more community-based and unbounded, can literally take years yeah. and it takes a lot of patience and just um, persistence, but in cycles. Um, and yeah, it might take a long time to see a change in someone's behavior, but it's absolutely possible. And so what are the practices associated with this? Um, depth without drowning, which is something we first heard in Novo Spaces, um, which is that while we want to go deep in our conversations, we also need to kind of self-regulate around not going so deep that we can't come back, we can't continue with the work. Um, and that part of when I say that, it kind of implies that you're expected to do that work on your own. Um, I think it has to be done in partnership with creating spaces that are intentionally for deep reflection analysis and cathartic feeling in community um, and not, you know, expecting people to do that on their own time. So I think it's a both and situation. Um, and then the other one is Emergent Strategy. Shout out to Adrian Marie Brown. What a transformative book for all of us. Um, but being flexible, being creative, adapting to the needs of the situation actually make you more effective and more sustainable. Um, I noticed where yeah. we missed something in the questions. Um, oh, Novo is, uh, oh man, what is it? What does it stand for? What does it stand for? It's a, it's a foundation. Um, particularly, I know their Move to End Violence um, fellowship, but they have a bunch of different fellowships. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what it yeah. stands for. I think they mostly focus on gender-based yeah. violence. Um, I think it's in California. I don't, I don't know. know. Um, <laughs> they, they, they have some great trainings on yes. um, racial equity. Um, and gender, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make a note. Um, if folks have um, questions, if you could send those to all panelists, um, then we can see that as well. And so we can kind of decide if we want to address that as we're moving or save that for a Q&A at the end. Mm -hmm. um, Chelsea, is there anything from the current questions that seems urgent? Um, nothing that seems urgent. I will okay. save it for the Q&A. We so we'll circle back. We'll circle back yeah. to that um, in the Q and A. Great. So the next one, this one's really close to my heart, um, is about being non-binary. Uh, and that's not just about gender, it's about a way of life, a way of looking at things that kind of deconstruct assumptions and binary thinking to embrace nuance, intersectionality, context, and uniqueness. And we will have a whole long session on this um, at the conference, which is really about rethinking our framing of gender-based violence beyond the binary. Um, we have just a ton of thoughts about this, but we wanted to share one tool, which I think is featured in the Beyond Survival anthology and that we love. There's an Instagram called at Vent Diagrams, and it's all about identifying kind of the tensions of things that are both true and moving through the middle. You don't actually write anything in the middle, but it's about finding that you are in the middle. You're the thing that balances these two sides. So an example of this is there's a Venn diagram that on one side says, I expect people to respect my boundaries and needs. And on the other side, I want to be flexible and adapt to what people are able to do. And so so it's not that one of those is more true than the other, it's that we want to hold both of those at the same time when we're figuring out our behavior. And so the practices that go along with that, one of those is something that I've already been saying, we say it all the time, which is both and, um, which is literally instead of either or or true false dichotomies, um, thinking about how multiple truths can be true at the same time. Um, and then the other one is take it or leave it. And this is something that Mariam is always saying, which is there's no right or wrong way of healing or doing this transformative work. Some may be more effective than others, depending on the situation and the person. And so even from everything that we've been saying today, take what works for you, take what you want to try and whatever you don't resonate with, you can leave it. That's totally fine. It's really up to you, um, your consent of what you want to implement. We're not trying to force any of these practices on you. Mm -hmm. And there really are, and I don't think, you know, should be, um, you know, really 
standardized practices around a lot of this work. Um, a lot of it is based in your your intuition, your understanding and perception of the situation, um, your self-trust. And I think that can induce a lot of anxiety for people of, am I doing the right thing? Um, but that's why it's so important to do a lot of your personal work and reflection and mindfulness um, to be able to trust yourself or at least have people that you can talk to. Yeah. And it's really important to put in the study, right? Which is like, you can tell throughout everything we've been doing, we're constantly reading books, we're constantly learning from different practitioners. That doesn't mean we're going to replicate exactly what they did, but it really is about study and learning um, in addition to your intuition and what you know. And it's, it's, it's a complicated thing to really articulate, but I think that it's really both of those things. And then finally, our last value is liberation. We genuinely believe that everyone can be and deserves to be free. That's very difficult because people have different uh, needs and desires and knowing how to navigate different people's, uh, you know, beliefs can be really challenging. And that's where these two practices that I would say are the bread and butter. I don't, I feel like I don't even eat bread and butter that much. I don't, I don't know. The, the vegetables and oil, I don't know, of our work. Uh, one of those is accountability. I really love uh, Connie Burke in the essay, Think, Rethink from The Revolution Starts at Home, um, talks about how accountability is an internal skill. And often we talk about holding other people accountable instead of learning the skill of knowing how to hold ourselves accountable. And that's really, really mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. I think that might actually be from trauma stewardship, which is another one we should. No, no, that, that, that oh, okay, quote yeah. is from, yeah. is from Think Rethink. Yeah. Um, and so we believe mistakes are teachers. Uh, it's important. Another important thing about accountability is it's important to be explicit about the norms and mechanisms in place to name and report harm. Like, do we call each other in one-on-one? -on -one? Is it possible for us to do it in the group? What does that look like? Um, can we call in a third party? Who is that third party? Is there an anonymous reporting mechanism? All of those things are really important when you're asking folks to know how to engage mm -hmm. those practices. Yeah, because especially if someone's in a trauma mindset and there's a high degree of uncertainty over what will happen if they report, if they ask for help, if they bring it up, that's an incentive to keep it to yourself and not seek help. Um, and then in responding to harm, we acknowledge intent because it's really important to know why something happened in order to shift that behavior, but we center the impact. Um, and I know people say acknowledge intent and impact. It's important to us to center the impact and acknowledge the intent. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have to keep in mind that accountability is not forgiveness. Just because someone addressed the harm, apologized, even shift their behavior, that doesn't mean that you have to forgive them. Those are not the same thing. Um, and then the other practice is consent, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more. We don't have a ton of time, um, but... Hopefully this is somewhat familiar yes. to this audience. So when we talk about consent uh, in this sort of work, it's that all of our work, whether it's as the facilitator, the participants, our partners, all of our work must be voluntary, informed, and conscious choices that are reversible. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about coercion, but we map the power dynamics and we have a really great power mapping tool that we'll present um, in one of our sessions at the NISCASA conference. I'm not sure exactly which one. Um, and directly counter the structural and community-based coercion and pressure to A, victim blame or minimize the harm, B, scapegoat and discard the perpetrate, perpetuator, C, place all of the responsibility and labor on the survivor or facilitator advocate. Right. Like most consistently when people start trying to do this work, those are the three pressures that come up because of the way that our culture operates. And so when we think about consent, we also think about how we're going to intentionally mitigate those pressures in our processes. Um, this is just the image that we usually use when we're doing trainings around consent. We have it on our Instagram. It's something you can use. Um, one really important thing about this is that we don't necessarily believe that consent needs to be enthusiastic. People communicate in very different ways. And especially if you're trying something that you've never done before, like a transformative justice process, <laughs> you might not be enthusiastic about it. Um, you might just be like, okay about it. And that means that it requires more check-ins, more conversation about how it's going, but people aren't always enthusiastic including people that I know who their most enthusiastic response is like, yeah, that's great. And so I think that that kind of prioritizes certain types of communication over others and knowing what you want before you're in it. And if you perform enthusiasm with something that you've never done before mm -hmm. and then realize that you're not into it, it can actually be more difficult to articulate that you're not enjoying it because of the level of enthusiasm you communicated at the beginning. Um, so that's one way that we deviate. 
The other thing is when we're talking about coercion, it's important to name what that is. So getting someone to do something that they otherwise would not have chosen to do, either because of pressure, abuse of power, which is where it's really important to map the power dynamics, use of force, or um, just unrelated incentives. Um, and we can talk about this a lot more another time. Mm -hmm. And that's the framework through which we understand most um, gender-based violence and most um, domestic violence or sexual harm. Um, we really view it through the lens of coercion. Um, you know, how, how intense what were the dynamics and how what were those dynamics leveraged? Um, and people have natural responses to being coerced um, or to being pressured or, you know, harmed. Um, these are natural biological responses rooted in the nervous system's instinctual self-defense. The ones that we usually hear about are fight, flight, and freeze, but it's really important to also name accommodate. Um, and many of us who were socialized either as female um, or who, you know, maybe were socialized that we need to perform what people with power tell us in order to be safe, uh, you won't actually get those responses. You'll get someone to just accommodate to what you want because of the extremeness of the power dynamics. And, or even maybe you begin with fight, flight, or freeze, and then it shifts to accommodate as the way to maintain yourself in that environment. And that's often a, a misconception when people are working with survivors, or especially people who are in ongoing relationships with folks who have been harming them. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and um, I think, Peter Levine um, and his kind of, he has, you know, some resources that are specifically very survivor centered. Um, we attended an amazing workshop that really helped um, us and a lot of people with him. Um, and he does some like retraining exercises um, for your nervous system. And um, that, that's a resource that could be good to check out if you're curious about that. Yeah, and then when we're talking about this, it's really important to keep in mind what do we mean by power? Um, and so we'll do that quickly. Uh, I wonder if anyone can type into the chat, who has power in your life? Um, answers we usually get are my parents, because we work with young people. And then when we work with adults, we get my kids, which yeah. is interesting. Um, we'll get my boss, my landlord, the police, the judge, God. Um, lots of the U.S. government, my mom, my boss. Yeah, thank you, Christina, for putting that in the chat. Um, and so it's important to name who has power first in order to identify what is power. Um, so does anyone want to type in the chat, how, what do you think power means when you're thinking about these people having um, power in your life? Maybe we can even just get one, one contribution before we move on to the definition that we use. Yeah, bosses, my past training, government, ooh, past training, that's deep. Mm -hmm. Resources I need, yeah. So the, the, these people have the resources you need. Yeah, exactly. Their choice comes before yours. Mm -hmm. Totally, that's resources great. Resources and agency, yeah. So you have needs, you need to get them met. Some people have... Um, Greater you know, access to resources. Could gatekeep you from that. Yeah. So there's an organization um, or a platform called Little Sis. And anyone's heard of Big Brother from 1984? Uh, this is kind of a play on that. It's a, a technical tool online for mapping power dynamics within the elite. And so we were originally trained uh, to use this platform in our work with the Dream Defenders to be able to map relationships uh, between uh, private prisons and the political environment. Um, and because they're mapping power, it was really important for them to have a definition for power. So their definition is power is the ability to manifest your will despite opposition. And what is that's rape culture, right? That's, that's the ability to do something without consent. And that can be really scary. And I think that that often causes people to think of power as something that's bad. Um, but I also really appreciate, I mean, we're passionate about Foucault, but uh, this is a separate professor or um, whatever, a uh, PhD who kind of translated some of Foucault's ideas in a more digestible way. Um, so, these are more Foucault's concepts of power, but written by Kevin. Power is transformative capacity, the ability of an individual to influence and modify the actions of other individuals or organizations in order to realize certain goals. Power is not a particular form or type of change. It is, in a strictly value-neutral way, the medium of change. Power is what makes change possible, whether that change limits freedom or promotes it. Um, and so as organizers, we're often talking about building power, uh, building people power, power in numbers, um, just other ways that are not necessarily about having power over someone, but 
cultivating that transformative capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this always makes me think of, um, our, our friend who we used to work more closely with, with the dream defenders, Phil, um, Phil Agnew, um, has this really powerful chant that he does with people. That's power, transformation, miracles. And, um, I think it's like interesting how when you add those things, like this understanding of power, when you leverage transformation, um, through whatever medium, um, things that you didn't think were possible. And it's possible. Like, like the concept of abolition that we were talking about earlier. There were a yeah. lot of people who didn't want that to change, and yet it was the power of, well, that there's a whole historical <laughs> argument about why that happened, but um, it took power to make something happen despite opposition. Um, and so it's not inherently a bad thing, and so it's really important for folks to reconnect with their sense of power. Right. Gotta close with Audre Lorde. To acknowledge privilege or power is the first step in making it available for wider use. Each of us is blessed in some particular way, whether we recognize our blessings or not, and each one of us somewhere in our lives must clear a space within that blessing where she can call upon whatever resources are available to her in the name of something that must be done. And so this is everyone has some sort of power and it's about really knowing how to redistribute that more equitably and help people grow that um, when they've been disempowered. Yeah, recognizing your power, leveraging your power. You know, if you if you identify as a person with privilege or if you're, you know, thinking about the privileges you hold, um, trying not to get into a shame spiral around that, but instead thinking like, okay, I have this. So what can I do with that? Right. Yeah. And I think that that's where as facilitators and as advocates, as people who are employed doing this, we have a real privilege and power in this work. And instead of being ashamed over that, it's about knowing how to leverage it. And there's mm -hmm. a great book, uh, Trauma Stewardship, that really talks about um, how we can think about our roles as folks who are working with people who are in trauma. And um, it talks a lot about this concept as well. Yeah. And so I don't think we'll have time today to walk through our safety plan. Um, yeah. But just to kind of close with this, whenever we start working with someone um, either who has experienced or perpetuated harm. Or training facilitators. Yeah, we start with a safety plan. Um, if basic needs are not met, people cannot focus on the process. Um, and everyone should fill it out, um, especially if you're, you know, for a, for a perpetuator, being in a state of crisis or not having basic needs met, is a huge roadblock to taking accountability because you don't feel like you're okay. And so you don't feel like you can take those steps to um, be vulnerable, maybe put yourself at risk um, that is necessary to go through an accountability process. And as a facilitator or even folks who are in support roles in a process, it's really important to be able to um, map your boundaries. And there's a big boundary mapping activity, which is what am I willing to offer? What am I not willing to offer? And what am I conditionally willing to offer or share? And that's really helpful to know before you're in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so because there's a lot of different tools in it, we often do those in three sessions. Um, the first session, is really identifying your support system um, that can be done in partnership with the pod mapping tool from the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective. There's a link to that in the um, plan itself. Um, and we always try to end the session on a high note. So it ends with identifying affirmations for yourself. Um, the second session is usually about identifying patterns in your body of what signs do you have in your body when you're feeling overwhelmed or burnt out or anxious? And then what practices will you put in place to address that? And then um, sometimes that'll be done with habit tracking tools to be able to integrate those proactively, not just in response to mm -hmm. being activated or triggered. Yeah, and I think a big challenge that folks who are trying to practice transformative justice, especially outside of an organization or institution with resources, is just like, people are struggling, people need help, people need resources, people need health care, right? And um, you can't, as an individual, provide that to them. And so some of the, um, what we encourage people to do is to come up with a resource sh sheet um, locally. And so that could include a community center, organizations, hotlines, um, different medical facilities, shelters, um, different practitioners, especially ones who will take certain types of cases um, at a pro bono or low cost rate. Um, and hopefully people who you know, have a good reputation um, in being values aligned, and ideally who you've kind of had some relationship with um, of them knowing that you might be sending them people. And the last thing is that this is a living document that changes over time. So this is something you should check in on regularly and be able to adapt and evolve as things go on mm -hmm. either in your life or in the process. 
Yeah. Um, so we try to do it quarterly. We're not always as on top of it as we should be, but that's kind of the goal, at least in our retreats. So in closing, what we covered in this conversation was our story, some of our core values and practices in doing transformative justice around gender-based violence, some about safety planning, and what we're going to be doing at the Niscasa conference in June is a panel with, uh, we're going to be interviewing folks from Insight, which I'm so excited about. Um, and then we're doing three pretty long sessions, um, almost day-long sessions, one on gender-based violence beyond the binary, rethinking our framing of gender-based violence, another one on implementing transformative justice in your organization, and I'll say that also applies to implementing it in your university, and facilitating transformative justice accountability processes, including a role play mm -hmm. for practice. Yeah, and then um, I think we'll go into a little bit of Q&A. We can stay over a little bit, but this is going to be pretty much the end of the, the content content, um, but if you're wondering how can I access some of your resources, um, I just want to put out a couple things. Chelsea posted a link to our website where on the front page you can download a um, or access a copy of the safety plan and maybe after like uh, during the Q&A we can pull that up and just kind of show people that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an example of the safety plan that we use um, adapted from social work. And then um, we also have a um, Cultivate Consent workbook that um, people like to use in, yeah, it has a lot of these tools and um, is, I, I love it. Um, and so you can get that on our website or um, we only- Those only come in packs of five because we want people to actually do it with other people in their communities. So it shifts the culture, not just the individual, but if you only want one copy. Yeah, then you can um, become a subscriber to our Patreon community. Um, and you can do that as low as $1 a month just to get access to resources. We have a transformative justice toolkit. We do monthly webinars and Q&As um, for that community um, and share resources. And if you subscribe, I think at $5 a month, we'll send you zines as we come up with them. I'm really excited because we're going to have a transformative justice workbook in this format by the conference. Um, so I'm really excited about that. We'll have those at the conference um, for a su suggested donation. Um, and then also you can get, um, if you're interested in our, our fictional books, you can also access those on our website or um, at a certain level, we will send you signed copies from our Patreon. Yeah. Um, and then did I cover everything? You can follow us on social media oh, yeah. at Time to Spring Up as well. Right. Um, so at Time to Spring Up. And then, um, yeah, and if you feel like I just want to continue learning in this, I want the ability to ask questions, um, I would totally recommend the Patreon community um, because that's an ability for you to, yeah, basically just have like kind of monthly check-ins and ask questions about how this is showing up and receive resources. And then I think Chelsea wants to mention a little bit more about the conference coming up. Okay. Give me one second to get my PowerPoint back up. Thank you all so much for your patience. So one thing I'd like to do um, before we move to Q&A, um, and if you have uh, questions that have come up for you, please feel free to stick them in the Q&A box. Um, I was able to actually acquire a copy of Spring Up's Transformative Justice Workbook. I'm a subscriber to their Patreon. And the, I wanted to share a little bit more about kind of the steps to an accountability process and who might be involved. Um, so the first thing you would do is really get to know the situation and identify, you know, is a transformative justice informed process even appropriate? Um, is an accountability process appropriate? Are circle process is appropriate or is it more important or appropriate to call law, law enforcement and that'll really depend on the situation um so the people involved here at this stage um 
you know, at the center is the person who has been harmed. Um, they should be consulted in making any goals and demands. Um, and they have the ability to choose how involved they would like to be. The goal here is to fight off or combat the isolation and disempowerment um, by making the survivor feel heard and supported throughout the process. There's also a person or people um, who should be the supporters of the person who's been harmed. Um, so they may be playing, they're playing a support role, they're advocating for the survivor or survivors. It's important that a survivor has consistent support throughout this process. Um, this role might be played by multiple people, could be friends, family, or professional supporters. If you're a victim advocate, that might be an appropriate role for you. This person will represent the survivor's needs in their place if the survivor does not want to be personally involved in a process or in, in, in meetings. The other people at the center of this process would be the perpetuator. Um, you heard Stoss use that term. Um, so the perpetuator here is the person who has perpetuated harm in this situation. So this person will go through a process to identify harm, recognize the consequences, make repairs for harm they've caused, and contribute to designing a strategy that shifts their attitudes and behavior to prevent the harm from occurring again. The goal is for the perpetuator to take accountability voluntarily for harm that has been done without ostracizing them from a support system or community in the process. And this person should also have supporters. Um, somebody who helps someone take accountability and doesn't fuel any denial, dis delays, or distraction. Um, this is also a role that's often played by multiple people, including friends, family, and professional support. Um, Alyssa, I am not seeing the chat, but in case anything comes up, um, please feel free to chime in. Um, another core role in a transformative justice informed process is the facilitator. Um, there might be one facilitator or multiple. Um, they're the people who facilitate any circles, any meetings, or any other components in the process. Um, this is someone who has experience working with conflict, someone who's knowledgeable about violence, trauma, mediation, um, who is in relationship with the community but has some distance from the situation itself. Um, it's important to note here that this person is aware and transparent about their biases um, and any relevant experiences that might shape their evaluation of the situation. Um, if you were able to join us for our webinars with Sujata Baliga on restorative justice processes, she talked about how there is, there's no such thing as neutrality or really objectivity in these situations. And it's okay to admit that. Um, what we're looking to do is end harm and end violence. So, you know, this first step is really getting to know the situation, getting to know who's involved, identifying what the survivor says they need and want. Um, at this point too, we're thinking about uh, safety and support plans. You know, what, what does a survivor need to be safe and secure in this moment? Um, do they need material resources? Do they need the person who harmed them to be isolated from the community at this time? Um, so a lot of this is very different from the traditional approach, which would be, you know, calling law enforcement. Um, although we do know, and it was mentioned in this webinar, that most people don't call law enforcement um, for instances of sexual violence or interpersonal violence. Um, and when they do, it's under investigated, it's under You know, it's uh, not prosecuted and people often don't face consequences for harm they've caused, even when law enforcement is involved. 
And so in the next phase, um, you would enter after identifying, you know, the situation, identifying safety planning, identifying who's involved and what they're going to do is you identify what shared values um, you're going to use and the community agreements. So as Stas and Lee mentioned, you know, identifying what values do we share and then what actions will we take that reflect those values. You'll also identify um, how you will communicate. You'll come up with a timeline for meetings. Um, how will things be documented? Um, what information will be shared and with whom? Um, so confidentiality is important. Um, you know, who has access to this information? Um, you'll also be mapping power dynamics. Um, and the biggest part really is the survivor support network, um, you know, works with the survivor to determine realistic, attainable um, needs. So what are the survivor's material needs? What are their needs from uh, an emotional or psychological standpoint? Um, and what do they want from this process? And that should really be the guiding factor. Okay. There's also, um, you know, the process itself, um, which can take many forms. And there are a number of resources that we'll share that outline what accountability processes can look like in different communities. And it, it really depends on the situation and the community itself. Um, and there's also always a space for reflection and evaluation um, throughout the process. So for those of you who are still with us, thank you. We've got a couple of questions that we would like you to respond to in the chat box. Um, did you hear or read anything that was new to you or surprising? And for those of you who have encountered transformative justice and TJ, informed processes before. What has been your experience? Great, I see. Yeah, someone's saying this whole topic is new. They've never encountered transformative justice before. Well, we're really glad you're here for this kind of introduction and exploration. Yeah, anyone else, um, feel free to pop it into the chat. And while you're thinking, um, we can also share that while the conference is clearly not happening, uh, we are working with Spring Up to develop some self-guided online classes, as well as um, some webinars that they'll be hosting later this, this year and into 2021. Um, we're really excited to be hosting a panel that um, the date is to be determined, um, celebrating 20 years of the Insight Women of Color um, organizing against violence conference and um, statement that they had put out with critical resistance. Um, you know, that explored and critiqued um, the relationships between the movement to end gender based violence and the movements to end racial, racial violence. We had someone pop in the chat, the consideration for safety planning for facilitators is very interesting. They think that if we step into these roles and the thought of acceptance of some harm in the place of another, and they love how there, there are some great things to help move me into another important way to view the work of transformative justice that includes safety for everyone. 
harm consideration should be for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that reminds me too of um, how, you know, for, I don't know how many of you are victim advocates, I'm assuming a majority, um, you know, many of us learn to, you know, come up with a safety plan for for our clients, for our survivors we work with, um, but we don't often have that opportunity um, to make that plan for ourselves. Yeah, and one of the things I, I really appreciate is um, Spring Up's safety planning document is really easy to work with and I highly recommend it. Thank you. So what are some possibilities that you can think of that um, a transformative justice-based approach to sexual violence can offer? And what remaining concerns do you have? Gina has also said that um, they work with the Native communities who have varied views and experiences of peacekeeping responses to violent harm. Another form that has come up, come up lately is the return to the death penalty as a form of, quote, traditional justice. This has been an interesting time for this conversation to expand. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing, Gina, um, is that getting a lot of support in the communities that you're working with? And yeah, that's also, you know, bringing me back to, you know, some of the features of transformative justice that we're talking about, um, you know, that doesn't reinforce or perpetuate violence. Um, you know, some community-based responses to violence could just be, you know, bringing out a bat, taking a bat to your rapist. Um, you know, that might be a community-based response, but that's not necessarily, um, you know, transformative. Um, it is something that perpetuates violence. Um, yeah, and Gina shared, um, that yeah, the idea of returning to the death penalty as a form of traditional justice has gotten support, especially in crime involving the death of children victims. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So we've got some time here, you know, for questions, um, additional discussion. Um, we're here till, till 4.30. Um, we do have a couple webinars coming up, um, which if I can get the chat back together, I will post those for you. I'm going to share some links in the chat momentarily. There we go. So I've shared the link to this PowerPoint slide as well as a ton of resources um, and readings that you might want to take a look at. Um, there's also a document there I shared a link to that has a series of um, examples of community-based accountability models. 
Um, there are also a couple of links to some webinars that we have coming up. The first is tomorrow at 2 p.m. A yoga practice as trauma-informed care led by Niskasa's Chris Ballerano. And on November 18th, we'll be hosting a webinar um, primarily intended for sexual assault advocates on billing for forensic rape exams. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, you know, feel free to continue discussion in the chat. Um, but that's all we have for content. Thank you so much for spending time with us.